Good morning and welcome to Global Healthcast, brought to you by Global Health Trust. In this podcast series, once a week, we bring to you news and views about infectious diseases, vaccines, and vaccination. I am Joe Schmidt, and with me is Dr. Melvin Senecas. Good morning to Switzerland. Good morning, Melvin. Good morning, Professor Schmidt. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to those who are watching us or listening us, listening to us today. The topics we cover today are singing rehabilitates speech production in post-stroke aphasia. Then Melvin will tell you about the status of new effective HIV vaccines. And I will remind you of what travelers should think about before they leave. And I have a little summary of uh, an unsystematic review of ongoing and new emerging infections and outbreaks and some general recommendations. Let's start with singing. Melvin, you are from the Philippines and I remember the Philippines as a singing country. You have a flooding, you have a storm, <clears throat> I'm sorry, you have a hurricane, whatever you have, people start singing. I like to be in the Philippines. It's always fun to be there and very joyful and singing is important. And you tell us why. Yes, so um, I, the reason why I chose this publication because I, I think this is really important. Um, we know strokes are the most common cause of aphasia, right? The speech disorder of um, cerebral origin. People with aphasia have a reduced ability to understand or produce speech or written language. And an estimated of 40% of people who have had a stroke have aphasia, and as many as mm -hmm. half of them experience aphasia symptoms even a year after the original stroke. And so researchers at the University of Helsinki in Finland um, previously found that um, music helps in the language recovery of patients after they had a stroke. Now, uh, the same researchers, actually some of them are from the same group, they have uncovered the reason for their rehabilitation effect of singing, and they published this in the journal eMuro. According to the findings, singing, um, as it were, repairs the structural language network of the brain, and um, the language network process language and speech in our brains, and, and so this is really important, right? And in patients with aphasia, the network has been damaged, and, and so in this study, they have shown that singing actually helps repair the damage of, of the language network processes in the brain. Very interesting. And actually, Finland is another singing country. If you ever have the opportunity to go to Helsinki, they have great organs and they have many organs in all even smaller places. They have a choir at the university. My friend Heikki Peltola was part of that, if I remember correctly. So there are many musicians in Helsinki and particularly in academia. So um, this fits well. I, I cannot comment much on the data. Yeah. But singing is important, right? Yeah, and I think the, the other thing that made this study really good and unique is that they were able to show that singing increased the volume of gray matter in the regions of the left frontal lobe and really improved uh, track connectivity in the brain. Wonderful. So singing increases your or may increase your IQ. And so it's very helpful, I guess, for everybody. Melvin, uh, you have a second uh, topic today, and that is HIV. Please tell us why HIV today and why vaccines and where are we with vaccines? Yeah, so um, May 18, which was just a few days ago, um, it was the HIV Vaccine Awareness Day, and it is celebrated every year to basically reflect on the ongoing efforts to develop a preventive vaccine against HIV AIDS. And um, the reason why I just highlighted this one is because we have some good developments in the past several years. And if you go to the next slide, um, this will show you basically one of those many developments, right? This is a model of broadly neutralizing antibody um, in, in humans uh, for, for HIV. And um, this is just one of the many uh, developments. There are many reasons why the development of a potential HIV vaccine is challenging, um, including the extraordinary genetic diversity of HIV-1 and the complex mechanisms of immune evasion. 
um, HIV-1 envelope glycoproteins are poorly recognized by the immune system, which means that potent broadly neutralizing antibodies or BNABs, as you've seen here uh, in the slide, are um, really useful for, 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 for this uh, kind of uh, disease, right? Um, and um, we know from several years now that uh, induction of potent and broadly neutralizing HIV-1 antibodies are, are really helpful in preventing um, HIV infection. Yeah, the, the story is really that uh, HIV, I guess, mutates once a day, right? If I remember correctly. And yes. this is why you need yes. a specific new yeah. approach. Yeah, and I, I think in, in virology lectures in the past, I remember professors would always say that for influenza, it takes six to 12 months to have something new. Um, for HIV, one to two days. Yeah. And for COVID, it takes a couple of months. Yes. And for HIV, it is once a day. So there are new approaches. So there's a new hope. Yeah. And, and on this slide, you will just see that uh, we have this mutation guided immunogen de design, which really aims to identify the improbable and the probable mutations in BNABs that are not routinely generated by somatic hypermutations. And, and basically, I think the, the simple way of saying is. Uh, explaining this is that these mutation guided immunogen studies and, and design help create um, immunogens that are basically covering what are the potential, um, let's say, versions of the HIV-1 virus that the body may encounter, right? So it's like, it's like looking at what um, is there at the moment and modeling <laughs> Uh, what will be the future versions of the, the virus and creating neutralizing antibodies for all of those potential versions as well. Very interesting approach. In the end, uh, it would be nice if we could tell the immune system how to address new mutations to come, how to detect them, and then uh, get, get the antibody response. But that that is next generation, right? Right now, mm -hmm. we need to design a vaccine expecting the mutations to come. And th that's what this shows. But in the future, very far future, 10, 20 years from now, we may be able to design, um, yeah, how do you, how, how would you call that? You would call it, um, uh, would design a vaccine that helps the immune system to adapt to changes in the respiratory pathogens or, or in HIV in this case, right? Yeah. yeah. Very interesting, very and that gives you hope. I have a couple of topics for travelers, and I start with measles outbreaks around the globe because this is a deadly disease with one per thousand of uh, um, uh, disease to die in the end, and there are a lot of complications that I don't even mention. The complication rate is twenty to fifty percent, depending on what type of host you are, and many destinations around the. Globe are reporting increased number cases of measles, and this is why you should be fully vaccinated at least two weeks before you leave your home country. The majority of imported measles cases in any country is probably in those who are unvaccinated. And finally, um, you should be fully vaccinated and you find um, vaccination recommendations in the public health office recommendations or by your NITEC recommendations in your local country. In the United States, vaccination against measles is um, um, sometimes even recommended for six to 11 months of children. We know today that the vaccine doesn't work well in the very young. It, it is working good as of about one year of age. But again, in specific situations, you can go down to six months and there are different recommendations by country. Upon returning, if you have not been vaccinated or if you are an immunocompromised person and if you start having a rash or a high fever, cough, runny nose, red watery eyes, think of measles and, uh, and call your physicians. Don't go his, to his or her office because you will, be, if you have measles, you're highly contagious. And if you're immune suppressed, you may not have a rash and you may not have a high fever, you may have just a plethora of any other symptoms. 
So for the severely immunosuppressed, measles is um, very difficult to diagnose. And again, it is highly contagious. And um, yeah, that, that is the thing you should, that, that is what you should know about measles. And here from the CDC, this is a map of the outbreaks um, of measles, uh, not around the globe, as the slide says, but it is in Africa and in uh, Asia, uh, largely the United States. And uh, um, I have on a different slide and I don't have Latin America here. What you can see is many places in Africa have measles and certainly also here in Russia, in India, in Afghanistan and all these places here in Southeast Asia, they have measles outbreaks and the list is here. Now this is uh, cases of measles in the United States. And as you can see here in 2024, they really had a big outbreak earlier this year. The sad story is like with COVID, it appears to me that there are particularly high number of cases and outbreaks in republicly run states where vaccination against measles is um, not recommended or maybe even discouraged for no good scientific reasons. But again, um, get your measles vaccine, follow scientific advice and don't follow any stupid advice from a politician. And that actually uh, includes the, uh, I guess, grand grandson of John F. Kennedy, who is a candidate for presidency, an independent candidate, and who opposes vaccination. Now, another disease to worry about in the United States is group A streptococcus. And actually in late 2022, there were outbreaks in several states of the United States of group A streptococci or streptococcus pyogenes. Uh, in 2023, then there was a high number of cases of GAS in older people, 65 plus, but then also there were increases in young children. And then uh, again, there were uh, a large number of cases later on. And just to remind you, um, there is more to strep A than a sore throat. You may have tonsillitis, pharyngitis, but there is also necrotizing fasciitis, streptococcal toxic shock syndrome and death. And then what they list on the website as non-invasive, but which is invasive basically is empyema, osteomyelitis, septic arthritis, and there may be also uh, pneumonia with acute hypoxic respiratory failure. So group A streptococcus is something to worry about. And if you do have tonsillopharyngitis with group A strep, get your penicillin for yourself to not come down with any of the secondary diseases like uh, rheumat uh, uh, rheum rheumatism, one rheumatic fever actually. So this is something to worry about. And uh, you should also um, do this for the people around you because uh, using penicillin, you will stop spreading the organism. And the final point I want to make is, again, I have an unsystematic, unsystematic summary of outbreaks that I, uh, I got aware of in the last week or so, which is yellow fever in South America, the flooding in Brazil, you all have heard about in the news and in the wake of that, please consider maybe cholera, hepatitis A, other types of infections, and there may be late epidemics due to um, low uptake of vaccines with all the routine vaccinations. Mm -hmm. There are pertussis outbreaks in Europe. Australia reports Ross River fever, and this looks like dengue, but isn't. In India, you may worry about West Nile virus and Kyasanur forest disease. That is two flady viruses. And actually, Kyasanur forest disease, you may be protected if you are vaccinated against uh, tick-borne encephalitis. At least immunologically, there is cross-reaction uh, with, with high neutralizing antibodies. If you have been vaccinated against TBE, uh, your immune system likely would also cover KFD. There's an outbreak of hepatitis A in Lebanon. And then last global health cast, we already covered Umrah and Hajj. And this is what you should be vaccinated against routinely. And specifically, go to the website of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for their recommendations for vaccination if you want to 
go to your pilgrimage to Umrah and Hajj. Finally, my travel advice is go to the WHO website. They have a global view on local recommendations. You may also consider going to your public health offices. Most of them have advice for travelers that does not only include vaccination, but other um, ways of preventing infectious diseases. And then uh, for some in, in some ministries of health or of foreign affairs, there may be specific recommendations depending on where you go. They may have uh, quite on time warnings, maybe before even the uh, public health institutes know, the foreign affairs institutes may know what is going on around the globe. Melvin, any topics or any additional points to the topics I covered, starting with measles and then going to strep A and finally to the outbreaks I covered here? No, I, th I think it's just important, Professor, to remember that if you travel, it's really good to check the website, the, the, the embassies of your country in those countries, and also check the Ministry of Health websites of that particular country you're visiting. I think it's really a good thing to do that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, finally, uh, I guess that brings us to the end and we have one cartoon in the end, but again, Melvin covered that singing is important, particularly if you have aphasia after a stroke. He um, updated us on uh, where we are with an effective HIV vaccine. I reminded you as travelers, now it is late May, if you wanna travel and June, Think about global measles, think about strep A, think, think about all the outbreaks that are going on around the globe and go to the website of WHO or your local public health office for specific recommendations for the country that you are traveling to. And Melvin, here is the final cartoon that you will cover today. Yeah, I, I think this is showing us the fountain of all knowledge, a tap of vocational insight, and the bucket of useless trivia, sprinkler of dubious facts, and the puddle of misleading statistics. So I think it's just funny to show all these uh, um, cartoon showing us the different sources of knowledge of people nowadays. Yeah, and what comes to my mind when I see this, and hopefully uh, our global health cast is fountain of all knowledge, right? I was wondering what is the difference here and how can you find out? I think one difference between science and stupid stuff and political uh, stupidness when it comes to vaccines and vaccination, I think it is science is democratic. A good scientist will listen to his or her opponent coming up with a different opinion. And he will try to find out if the opponent or the another scientist has a point. And he will challenge his own research with the points from someone else. And I think so good science is democratic and can be challenged. And if it is challenged, that improves to better knowledge. Whereas all the others, uh, particularly the, uh, the sprinkler of dubious facts and the puddle of misleading statistics, they won't accept uh, any criticism or a different view. I think this is the big difference. What do you think? Yes, um, the, the big difference is that for people of science, you actually listen to those who have different views. But for people of pseudoscience, they will never listen to you and they just have their own set of messages that they stick to. Yeah. Thank you very much for listening to us today. And uh, I say goodbye until next week. And Melvin, you have the last word. Yeah, so thank you very much for listening, everyone. Stay safe.